Okay, we will now continue with the uh, second part of the uh, presentation. Um, first, I would like to, um, to give attention to the, uh, the second half of this slide, in which we, um, what we will see there is that uh, usually the, 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 the daily routine of a laboratory focuses on the acquirement of specimens, eh, phlebotomy, uh, drawing blood, uh, spinning the uh, material, um, having the serum being put onto the instruments, perform the tests, uh, check if your internal quality control is okay, if not, uh, try to uh, perform corrective actions. If that's okay, then we can actually release the results and report them to the requesting physicians. But that's only a small part, it's, it's, a, well, it's a small part, I, I mean it's, it's a big part of the, our daily routine, but for the, uh, what we usually forget is that before um, an, an, a test is being uh, implemented, or before a test is part of the routine of a laboratory, validation have to, has to take place. And it usually begins with the selection and evaluation of a diagnostic test. Uh, we simply start, do not start in the laboratory by putting into um, uh, tests into routine use if there is no demand for it. Uh, nowadays we are discussing a lot about molecular tests. Uh, physicians request us if there is, if we can provide them with those types of tests. So uh, usually there is a request from the physicians for a new test. Hey, I have been to a conference and they've told us about a new test. Is this something that we can have here in Curacao or in Aruba of Bonaire, for instance? Uh, we usually go back to the literature, we read a little bit, we check if we, um, if we find this new test of added value to the test that we, are, we currently have in the laboratory. Uh, Will it be able to be more specific for certain types of patients? Will it be a better test compared to the old tests that we have? We are not talking about instrument or anything at that stage, but we are simply uh, discussing the uh, added be benefit of the test. Once, once we have determined that a test will be of added value to our patients or to our physicians, we will select a method of analysis and we will discuss later on the, the various um, characteristics that we use for determining if a certain method will be used. We will then start by validating the method and usually it goes uh, okay. Some, uh, sometimes uh, the validation has some flaws and we usually using the PDCA uh, cycle, I, I assumed that uh, you will know what PDCA stands for, but it's Plan, Do, Check, Act, which is a very important part of the quality circle. Uh, once you determine that there is a problem, you will try to uh, find the cause, solve it, check if it works, and uh, improve your method. So if you, your validation doesn't go well, you will do a, a check for error and try to solve the problem. After you have validated the method, you will implement the method and uh, you will write SOPs, provide training, and then the method is ready for routine use, which is the second part of this slide. As I told you, uh, there are some characteristics which we look at when we are discussing a new test. Uh, once we have, we have already determined that we will need a new test in our laboratory because it will be of added value to our physicians or our patients, and then we will start looking at some characteristics of the tests that are uh, available on the market. It very much depends upon, for instance, the cost of test. What will it cost me to run a test on this instrument that I have in the laboratory or I have an alternative instrument also in the laboratory from a different vendor or from the same vendor uh, that uh, maybe has a different cost of test. Uh, maybe I have an automated method and I have a manual method. Uh, those are things that you will usually uh, uh, try to decide for yourself which will, uh, which will be more cost benefit for you. Sample type. For instance, in a, uh, in a hospital laboratory, plasma samples are being used more and more because they don't simply have the time to wait 
for the serum to um, coagulate so uh, they will use heparin um, um, samples in chemistry. Uh, the turnaround time in a hospital you have little, bit, little time available when compared to a physician's uh, laboratory. Sample volume, if you're handling a lot of pediatric samples you will uh, look at methods that have the capability of using small volume of serum or plasma. The instrument and personal requirements, uh, if it's something that you are using on an instrument that you already have, it's much uh, easier than you, that you have to bring in a whole new instrument. Space is an issue, yeah, portability, <coughs> if it's something that you have to do point of care or near patient, and what is the safety issues regarding the new test. Once you have determined that this is the something that you will go with, then you will look at the uh, analytical sensitivity and specificity. Uh, is this a well standardized uh, method? Is it something that is traceable to a higher standard? Uh, how about the calibration? Is it something that you have to do every day, once a week, twice a week? And robustness? Uh, is it something, is the, is the uh, assay robust? Is it um, uh, influenced very uh, easily by interferences such as lipemia or hemolysis? Uh, so that's, that's our issues that you will look for in a new assay. And then you will look at uh, the performance of the uh, new method, reportable range, precision, recovery, interference and detection limit, and we will uh, address those issues in the next part. Usually I uh, do the validation in using this framework. Um, I've told you before that we try to be as simple as possible with the validation here on the islands, which means that there are parts of the validation which we saw a couple of slides ago uh, in the uh, ISO 15189 standard that we usually do not perform in the laboratory uh, here in the islands uh, simply because it will take too much uh, effort um, which you will not uh, and it doesn't give you back a better test. Uh, uh, I can give you some examples later on during the presentation. What we, this, what you see here on the slide is something that you, that's, well, I think the minimum amount of tests that you, of, or I'm sorry, the minimum amount of experiments that you have to perform in order to comply with ISO 15189. And you will see that it's being um, divided by two types of, of experiments, preliminary, like a screening, and final which are the definite tests. And because we have different types of error in the laboratory, the experiments try to get an indication of the uh, amount of error uh, for the various types of error. We have random errors, which are very much related to precision. So the preliminary, preliminary experiment will be a replication test, which will be done on the day one day, whereas the final test will be a replication test or a precision test being done during various days. That's something about precision. You also have constant error, which means that if you have to measure here but you have a bias, you're measuring too high, uh, that's something that you have to um, uh, get quantitated and see if there is a constant error in your new method. In an experiment is an interference test, uh, which is very uh, quick and dirty to do, and of course the final test will be a comparison of the old method versus the new method. And uh, for the preliminary uh, experiment for the proportional error, which, which means that proportional errors are pretty much dependent upon the concentration, uh, the, the, the easiest ones are there are in small amounts there's not so much of an error, but once you go into the higher concentration, you're, you'll get a more bigger of a, um, of a bias. Uh, that's something that you can test for in using recovery experiments. And we will, we will show um, in the following slides how we do that here on the islands. 
It's very important to realize that this is the minimum amount of experiments that I think that you should, should perform. Uh, and uh, of course, based on the specific situations, you can also add some more experiments. Um, when you're doing validation studies, you should have a plan. And the, plan the plan compri is, is being comprised of various ele elements. Uh, we will see here uh, two of those um, uh, elements. Uh, in this next uh, slide, you will see the, an, another two. And the first one is the fam familiarization period. The second one are the preliminary experiments. The fam familiarization period um, is comprised of four key uh, parts, which the first one is uh, establishing uh, working procedures uh, for you guys as a uh, technical um, support from the manufacturer. It's important to realize that you have to um, give the customer the chance to come uh, familiarized with the working procedure so that he or she is capable of performing the test by itself. You should validate the reportable range, which means that you will have to check on the lower part and on the higher part if you are capable of measuring uh, results and uh, yeah, validating the reportable range by this way. And you have to check calibration. Uh, did the calibration went well? Document it and check the detection limit. The preliminary experiments, as we have said before in the, in the, in the earlier slide, you have to perform a within-run replication study, uh, an interference study uh, using hemoglobin, um, icteria, and lipemia uh, as three main elements for determining if there are interference uh, in the new test. I shall tell you upfront that that is something that we usually do not perform. Uh, auditors haven't been very strict with us on this item, but uh, if you look at various abstracts that are being um, presented at, uh, at, um, at conventions of the Dutch uh, Clinical Chemistry Association, you will usually find something back about interference. And this is something that's not very difficult. It's simply adding um, um, hemoglobin, bilirubin, or um, lipids to uh, known amounts of uh, the analyte and see if it interferes with the uh, recovery. Now, you should also perform recovery studies. Uh, I will um, discuss that uh, a little bit uh, later on in a further slide. And after you have performed the preliminary uh, experiments and everything went well, you can tell that you're ready for the second part of the experiment, uh, experimentational phase, which is the performing the total um, replication study. Um, you will usually uh, do a comparisons of methods and afterwards you will finalize the experimental um, um, part. You will usually conclude that the, more, the method performs well, it's acceptable to being used and you will then validate or I'm sorry, verify the reference interval. We will see that later on. And of course as everything with quality nowadays, we have to document and we have to sign off. Then we will uh, implement the procedure, and I think you all know how that's being done. You will have to write a procedure for the, I'm sorry, you first of all have to select your um, correct QC procedure. Um, that's something um, I think that will change in the, in the years to come, but due to time I will not focus on, on this part uh, now. You will have to write an SOP, train the uh, medical technologists to perform the, um, the, um, the procedure right. That's something that usually is being done by the laboratory itself. You have to introduce the method for service. And uh, what I like to do is, I, as you may know, we do participate in external quality control uh, schemes. And I like to, when I introduce a new method, I like to uh, give um, more attention to the new methods uh, to 
check for myself if the method performs well. And I usually, uh, when I'm signing off the external quality control uh, reports, I usually make a specific comment about that, so that the auditors will see that we are also, after that we have implemented the new method, um, give further attention to this uh, new method and that we are that we realize that we have a new method in use that we have to gain experience with how do we check for linearity or reportable range now that's that's something that uh, nowadays has become much more easier uh, usually i think that something that manufacturers should do is that whenever they are discussing um, with the client about validating new studies, uh, new um, tests, that they should, one way or the other, uh, provide, usually, uh, or provide uh, linearity samples um, that are commercially available. An alternative is that the laboratory will use um, patients' samples that are uh, of a high uh, value and that you simply dilute to a lower concentration. And so you can demonstrate that the method performs linearly and that you can use that whole concentration range as, uh, and then you have verified the concentration range and that you can um, report results in those, in the, in the reference range, or I'm sorry, in the reportable range as was being uh, stated or claimed by the manufacturer. Uh, how you can do it, you will can see here on the, fly, on the slide. Usually you take four or five levels. Uh, if you're using patient samples, you're using a high concentration which you, uh, um, which you um, mix with a, is a very low sample, a zero sample. Um, there you have a 50% value and then you will mix those two to 25% and those two to 75%. 